Welcome, my friends, to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm DC Gomez, and I'm thrilled you're joining me today for a fun conversation with a passionate author. We're kicking off the program like it's our tradition with a short reading from the feature book. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Sandra Waugh, and co-author Melanie Murray Downing and I wrote a trilogy, uh, The Adventures of the Flash Gang. It is about a street orphan and his ragtag crew who foiled a pro-Nazi plot in 1935 Pittsburgh. And I'm going to read you a bit of the first chapter of the first book. So here we are, The Adventures of the Flash Gang, Episode 1, Exploding Experiment. Chapter 1, The Streeter. 11-year-old Lewis Carter sat scrunched between a wall and a giant pickle barrel at Nurtzer's Pittsburgh Grocery. The spot was sticky and stank of vinegar, but he could see the whole shop from there, small and square, with a hodgepodge of tinned goods, loose vegetables and specialty meats crammed onto shelves and counters and in bins. To Lewis, who hadn't eaten since the day before, everything looked delicious. It was nearly dinner time, and for the past ten minutes, he'd been planning assorted meals in his head, using everything but the pickles. Bologna on Wonder Bread, steamed cabbage with fried eggs, saltines and sardines, his mouth watering with each combination. Customers shuffled past. Some wore snug overcoats. Some wore the haggard expressions of sorry times. None of them noticed Lewis. He was just another scrawny, pale boy with unkempt hair and threadbare clothes, lingering inside to cheat the cold. Lewis looked like what he was, what he had been for exactly 114 days, a streeter. And except for his eyeglasses, he was as forgettable as any other streeter in the chilly March of 1935. Streeter, not orphan. There was a distinction. Orphans were swept into charities, buttoned into gray uniforms, and bunked in gray dormitories that smelled of pine disinfectant. Streeters, on the other hand, devised their own shelters and their own methods of survival. And whether they worked in groups or operated alone, all streeters preferred to pinch a meal, to sleep under the stars with frost chewing their fingertips, than to be lost to a grim institution. Besides, Lewis Carter wasn't an orphan. His father was just temporarily missing. He peeled his sleeve from the brine-stained wall again inside. He'd been patiently waiting for the perfect moment, but now his stomach was growling ferociously. Mrs. Nurtzer squeezed by for a third time, straightening jars and dusting shelves. Mr. Nurtzer stood behind the meat counter, not ten feet away, waving Frankfurt a lynx while he chatted with customers. Lewis added hot dogs and baked beans to his imaginary menu, and his stomach growled some more. Then, suddenly, the moment arrived. Mr. Nurtzer set down the hot dogs and lifted a round of sausage, presenting it like a proud papa and generously calling out, free tastes. The grocer began carving tissue-thin slices of the meat as what seemed like the entire store rushed to the counter. Lewis stayed where he was, his mouth curving into a smile. Finally, he could begin. Working quickly, Lewis pulled a scrap of handkerchief from his jacket and laid it on his knee. From the jacket's left side pocket, he took a pouch that held what looked like a tablespoon of sludge. It was thick, sticky, and black. Lewis smeared some of it on the handkerchief. Next came a sort of ashy material, like the remains of a paper fire, from the pouch in the jacket's right side pocket. He measured the ash by feel, sprinkling it over the sludge. An off-duty copper hustled by, heading for the meat counter. Lewis held still until the officer passed, then reached down and ran his fingers along the floor, scraping up a bit of dirt. He removed his eyeglasses, rubbed the dirt on the lenses, and put them back on. Then he folded up the handkerchief scrap, gave it a good squeeze, and dropped it on the floor. Lewis now had twenty whole seconds. He wiped his hands on his knees, then stood up and stepped into the aisle, pretending to study the canned soups. Mr. Nurtzer was cracking jokes about liverwurst. The copper was in front of the grocer, cramming sausage slices into his mouth. Ten seconds gone. Excitement tingled into Lewis's fingers and toes. Now came the best part. Ten. Nine. Eight. Casually, Lewis reached for a burlap sack that was folded over a mound of onions in a wicker basket. He slid it from the pile and rolled it in his fists. 
Then he squinted through the dirt smudges, scanning for just the right spot. Seven. Six. Five. There. A bin brimming with oranges just steps from the meat counter with its sumptuous display. Lewis maneuvered between the two and stopped right next to the copper. Four. Three. He nodded politely at the officer who was reaching for another slice of sausage. Two. Then grinned wide. One. First came a small whoosh, followed by a soft pop, and then burst the most dazzling flare of light, expanding like an enormous umbrella, brighter than a hundred flashbulbs. Everyone in the shop froze until Mrs. Nertzer screamed at the top of her lungs. The gasps came fast and furious. No! Where? Quick! Can you see them? See them! Try and catch them! Out of my way! I got them! The copper barked and then ran blindly into the pickle barrel, knocking down several customers like dominoes. There were oofs and owls and people tripping over each other. Meanwhile, Lewis, whose smeared glasses shaded the glare, was gleefully packing the sack full of sausage and cheese, then oranges and cabbages and mustard jars and loose potatoes, food for him, food for the soup kitchen at St. Patrick's. A pungent smell of rotten eggs permeated the dazzle. People were covering their mouths and noses between cheering. The bell on the front door was jangling. Lewis didn't pay any mind, stuffing, stuffing, stuffing the sack, and then walking, not running, through the shop. And also not coughing. That pirate required a distinct resolve. Mr. Nurtzer was beside himself. Flash gang, it's the flash gang. Call the post, give that the sun. Lewis exited into a burst of cold air, which briefly knocked the grin from his face. He coughed and cleared his throat, then pushed through the crowd that was already pressing in. Plucky streeters, wealthy crusts, and everyone in between, all rushing toward the umbrella of light. Mrs. Nurtzer threw herself like a tarp over the bins of vegetables outside the store to keep her wares from being knocked over. She was screeching in bursts. Here, they chose our shop! They, Lewis could have laughed out loud. Across the busy intersection was a tailor shop. Lewis aimed for it, wedging himself inside the triangle-shaped folding board by its door, advertising two suits, twenty dollars. He sorted out his knees and feet, cleared his lungs properly, and wiped the dirt from his glasses. Then he pulled a sausage from the sack and settled down to watch the hubbub. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Inside the Minds of Authors. I am so glad you guys are joining us today for another conversation, this time with two fabulous authors that are joining us on this show. If you're new to the podcast, go ahead and subscribe. You don't want to miss a single episode. We have new authors bringing us amazing books every Monday night. So make sure to join. You want to always come and hang out with us. We're always better when we're growing together. So if you have some time, share the show reviewers give us some love we're here for it so let's start because you guys are here to talk to our amazing guest miss sandra miss melanie hello congratulations on this trilogy i am loving it thank, thank you. you thank you for having us yes it is such a pleasure Ms. sandra you did an amazing job in that reading i was like oh that is so good <laughs> yes thank she's you. pretty great <laughs> absolutely i loved it so let's start with kind of the question that i have for every single author that joins us is where did this idea come from and what is it about? Because you guys have me like, what? what is happening here? This is so good. <laughs> Melanie? <laughs> well, the idea was born of brainstorming sessions between Sandra and I. We had met in a writer's group. She was writing young adult. I was writing young adult at the time. I had also written some adult books. And we wanted to try our hand at writing a middle grade. We thought it would be fun. We thought it was kind of an experiment to write a book. We both were voracious readers as kids and had the same sensibility of the kinds of books we liked. We liked orphans. We liked smoggy settings, gritty street life. We loved the orphans of Dickens. And we set out to see if we could write one. We spent many, many, many hours and weeks brainstorming what it would be, where it would be, who the characters would be, what the story would be. And we kind of lucked into this idea of the Great Depression in Pittsburgh, which obviously is not the London of Dickens, but has all the qualities that we loved about Dickens' London. It was a rough place to be in the 1930s. There were these great, huge steel factories that operated there on the banks of their three rivers. And they just would belt all this dust and smoke and smog into the atmosphere all day. And it left Pittsburgh very dark and gritty. And 
one of our favorite details is that they had to keep the streetlights on all day because it was so dark. So I think once we set upon Pittsburgh, then everything just kind of flowed from that. The story was very tied into that setting. It was a process of discovery, for sure. When you both decided to start working together, and I always ask teams of authors, who does the writing, like typing? Who is in charge of that? How does that work? I um, love that question. <laughs> So this is our first time collaborating with anybody. So we kind of just dove in. It's my impression that other authors who collaborate tend to alternate chapters with different voices. We didn't. (laughs) So we both wrote and we both threw it at each other. And then we did have to kind of have a voice. I feel like we created a new voice, actually. A new voice. I think it was was was, a combination. It's a little bit of Sandy. It's a little bit of me. But it was something that we couldn't have struck upon on our own. And we've written three books together in this series. And by the third book, it's just almost not a discussion. Like, we know what the voice is. We know how to make the chapters sound. And in that respect, it doesn't actually matter who does the writing. But we do trade everything we write back and forth. Yeah. This is a huge learning curve for both of you since it's the first time you're collaborating. Trying Very to much. figure it out, how do we work together as a team? How was that for both of you? I also have a learning curve. <laughs> but I think, first of all, I think we're both, we're compatible in our sensibilities and what we're looking for in a story. So that was set the groundwork. We understood as we went, we started to understand each other's strengths and sort of let the strengths, whoever that person's strength was, let that lead the way. I think also... We just are patient and cooperative and you have to learn that it is a duo. So you have to give and take. It's a great lesson in killing your darlings. Yes. Um, (laughs) Because, you know, something that I might think was amazing, Sandra might not. And it was actually what she said. It's collaborative. We have the same sensibility and our individual strengths happen to fit like a puzzle. They, mine complement hers, hers complement mine. And when we write, in some regards, it's greater than the sum of its parts. So I think once you realize that that's what the product is, it's very easy to collaborate and listen. And it's wonderful to have access to somebody else's creative mind. She often would have ideas that I would not have had. And then they sparked my imagination. And I was able to, you know, come up with ideas that I wouldn't have if she had not sparked it. So I think she probably had that experience a bit too. So in that regard, it's almost like a great game of improv. <laughs> like I throw me an idea you. and let's carry it forward. Yeah. I can see you've both been working well with each other because you can play <laughs> off even in the interview. Like it flows so well from one of the other. Like, oh, yeah. You guys have been I'm, doing this for a while. How long I, have you been yeah. writing together? Well, I think it's going to be close to 10 years just because we kind of started and then we stopped and we started again, the pandemic hit. All of those things sort of th- were thrown into the work. Humor is a big part. You know, we have to have a sense of humor. We have to remember it's a story. And so we're looking for the love of the story, not our own egos. So Oof, yeah. that's such a good way of looking at it. 1930s, how much research and who did the research went into these books? We both Equal. did. Equal. Again, as Melanie was saying, that sort of love for those, you know, dark back alleys and gritty, smoggy places and discovering that Pittsburgh sort of fit the way and then looking for orphans. I mean, Great Depression, it was sort of fell in our laps. And then we kind of picked a date and then started to realize as we were researching certain things happened in this year that we could use in Pittsburgh. And then in just in terms of research, the first thing I think that came in the mail was a map that was back from the 30s of Pittsburgh, which is different than it is today. And so just looking at a map and starting to see these little streets and these little names and then comparing it to photographs and trying to figure out where the rail lines were running along the city and where the staircases were, these clatter, you know, the, the, uh, Pittsburgh is so great because it has so many steep ridges. And the, as Melanie said, the three rivers, you know, there are all kinds of like nooks and crannies and then those staircases they could run up and down the inclines and so forth so it was a bit of a storyteller's gift the setting because there's so many intricacies to Pittsburgh and 
We also got a real kick, I think, out of just researching the little things like the clothing and what would a suit cost at that time and what kind of food was available to them. Like all those kinds of little things, I think we're both just very curious people. I found the research to be quite as much fun as the writing. And I think Sandra probably did too, because we discovered so many fun things that sparked our imagination and fed into the story. As she alluded to, the first book culminates, there was a great fire that burned down a church in Pittsburgh in 1935 in real life. And we were like, that's great. That's going to be in our book. And we happened to have a similar event that we found for the second book. The research was illuminating and interesting and a lot of fun. Well, and let's not forget Nazis because yeah, there's Nazis too. Always, you know, we always want, along with our brave kid, you need a really good villain, and so it's a better I villain we... than the Nazis. And and we were sort of in our first throws. It was like, oh, you know, of course there'd be a Nazi plot in 1930s. You know, why not? But then as we began to research, we realized, holy cow, there it's not was. just you know something we can kind of pull out of the, it's it's a big thing there was a a huge pro nazi groundswell in those times and and we kind of caught that current and started to ride with it and found as melanie was talking about not just details about burning churches but just this kind of dark period not just poverty wise but where the country was headed and and it's just sort of fascinating to us like so much of our research that aspect was a happy accident because we wanted initially we like what kind of bad guy do you have in a great depression and our initial idea was well obviously one with a lot of money but that's been done and we wanted to put a twist on it so that's we came up with the idea maybe he really is sympathetic to what's going on in Germany and then that led to that wasn't a fantastic idea of ours that was actually happened. Yeah. History played such a great part in helping you guys set the setting without even knowing it. So <laughs> somebody in the universe is like, hey, this story needs to tell ladies, yeah. your guys are it. Right now is the trilogy. Is there any other more indications of more episodes to come? Or are you guys are going, we're just going to wrap this up. What is next with the Flash game? Well, we realized that our children are 11 and 12 in 1935 and 36, which if you date them. And our book ages between books one and two, there's a year that passes. So we are not sort of just writing installments of their daily lives. It's time passes. And so they are growing up. And we realized that come 1942, when we enter World War II, they're 18. We've We're very taken thought. with that idea lately. And <laughs> when we think about future we Story. realized, yeah, this is a trilogy, so start to finish. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of our characters. If we did continue, it would have to start a new series, let's say. But that aside, we're letting things simmer. We're, you know, I don't think we're done writing with each other. So <laughs> together, yeah. You guys have enjoyed the process. And just listening and watching your interactions is so much fun. that You're like, I can <laughs> see this continuing because you guys are enjoying the process. Your characters are so well. And the reading was so much fun that it's kind of always amazing to be like, two people wrote that? Really? How did that yeah. work out? So it's really, really, really fun. We take How that as he... a great compliment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. It is beautiful. I was like, it makes you always wonder. I'm like, that's impressive. How well that flow. <laughs> what is next for you guys as individuals? Because you both also are writers on your own. You guys are writing together. What are you guys are working on now? Oh, well, I am... <laughs> in another sort of historical thing, it's more of an adult tale and it's very dark. It's a story um, that takes place in the backdrop of the Chicago Columbian Exposition, the, the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, tracking a serial killer there. Not the one that we all know about in true history, but my own made up serial killer. And then I also, my original YAs are fantasies. So I have a fantasy I'm revising right now, too, that sort of a little time spanning. And fantastical with demons and things. So that's me. <laughs> She's always got so many pots on the stove, you know, and it's always sometimes I listen to her and I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know how she does it all. I have less pots on the stove, but I've been spending a lot of time. We're doing a lot of promo for th this trilogy. And I do have a couple of uh, adult ideas that have been partially written and cooking away. And so I'll probably get back to those in about a month or so. There's a manuscript of hers I've read too from years ago that I keep pushing her to finish. So, <laughs> yeah. So, we'll get that I have one to done finish too. just for her. 
<laughs> Isn't that what friends are for? So they can push people <laughs> off and be like, hey, you really need to finish that book. I love it. I think our partnership is so successful because we each really think the other is very good. I'm so taken with all of her ideas and her stories, and she is very generously very supportive of me too. So I actually, if Melanie likes something I wrote, I'm ecstatic. So <laughs> it's a big compliment. That is the best partnership to be. And the fact that you're working together shows that you not only appreciate, you respect each other and you love each other's work. So that's kind of a great compliment. I'm like going to imagine that authors in general, you know, there's always one part of the brain that's just off thinking of a story that's coming out of something that happens in daily life or something they read or we read or see or whatever. But it's like you can't help in that creative mind just to always be having some thread going somewhere. There's I'm always something percolating. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ladies, what advice would you give up and coming authors, especially ones that are looking to start collaborating? What would you tell them? I think the most important thing is find someone's work that you admire and that you seem to have a similar sensibility to. I think authors who are just starting out, I think the community is so important because it can be a rough sort of the business side of of writing stories can be there are there are great ups, but there are very low downs. And if you have a community of people who believe in you and who you keep you honest, keep you remembering that it's really just about you know, as Sandra just said, like channeling all the story ideas onto paper. I think that'll help you be creative and stick with it and go forward. In my opinion, I mean, I think people have different attitudes about this, but I'd say write for yourself. Keep writing for yourself. Keep writing. I mean, there are things to learn, obviously, how to plot or how to structure a book or whatever, but write because you want to write. Don't write because you think there's some current contemporary thing that's in the the zeitgeist right now that you should co-opt. I think you should be writing because there's something coming out of your, a need that's coming out of your spirit. So, so if you feel that, go for it. This is a very, very nice, very beautiful way of putting it for anybody who's interested. Ladies, where can our listeners find the books where they can learn more about both of you? Tell us. We have a website that we would love people to come to, and that is downingwa.com. The books are available at all the usual places, Amazon, BNN.com. We do love to support indie bookstores. So if you do want to order a copy online, bookshop.org is a wonderful place. It is available in some brick and mortar stores as well. And any place, any bookstore that you walk into can order it for you. I love it. Awesome. So before you leave us, are you guys ready for the lightning round? Oh, gosh. No, <laughs> not at all. Oh, that dead? No. <laughs> They're easy peasy, don't think too hard, and we're going to go both. Do we each answer them or do we alternate? (laughs) You're each going to answer them because I'm curious to see how you both answer these. So we're going to start with Miss Sandra. Coffee or tea? Tea. Melanie? Coffee. Okay. Interesting. All right, Melanie, with you. Spicy or sweet? Sweet. Maybe spicy. (laughs) Of course. Right, starting with Sandra, cats or dogs? Mm, I love them both, but I'll go for dogs. Okay. Melanie? I also love them both and have them both, but I'm surrounded by cats right now, so I will say cats. Okay. For such a compatible duo, you're both on the extreme. <laughs> we it's we a complement balance, each other. Yeah, it's a good It's balance. a really very beautiful balance. I'm impressed. <laughs> so, Sandra, starting with you. Scary movies or comedy? Ooh. <laughs> I, I'd sort of say scary as long as it's not horror, you know. What? I don't even know you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I like them all, but really? yeah, I, I like scary books. Let's put it that way. So, right. Melanie. Comedy. <laughs> I'm too scared it. of the real world. Yeah, that's it's true. It's true. To laugh. As long as it's, yeah. I don't like gore, but, but chills are good. I'm learning so things. I know. This is the reason <laughs> we're doing it. It's always yeah. fun. A little different one. See how you guys both, and we're going to start with Melanie. If you had a superpower, what would it be? Lightning round? I don't. I have to think about this. Invisibility would be good. (laughs) I've heard that. But also, some sort of superpower that helps my children get all their schoolwork done on time. Is there there some superpower? Time management. 
the ability to gift people with time management or, or more time. I'm in. Yes. yes. Sandra. Oh, uh, you know, That's would I like to one. fly? Yeah. But I'm also sort of thinking, are there those like sort of fairy godmothers that are able to sort of just tap someone and make them feel better? Kind, you know, like imbuing with kindness would be a super power, I think. Ooh. A really good one i like ladies it has been such a pleasure having you both on the show thank you for joining me congratulations on this trilogy so much fun any closing remarks oh thank you for having us this was delightful i'm admiring all your books in the background so I'm a book collector read on you know is what i'm gonna say <laughs> ah, yes it has been a pleasure thank you thank you to our listeners, check out this trilogy. Check out these amazing authors. You are going to enjoy their sensibility and their humor all into one book. I will see you guys all again next week with another fabulous author. Bye, guys.